Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first ever virtual Israel Forum. I'm Rabbi Joy Levitt. I'm the CEO of the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan, and it's such a pleasure to be here this morning with so many of you virtually. As many of you know, the Israel Forum was created with the intention of creating a civil and productive environment within our community in which to engage in real and challenging issues around Israel. The JCC is a community center, a place where our robustly diverse Jewish community comes together. It is not our goal to achieve consensus on difficult issues. It would be a mistake to do so, and in any event, we would fail. But it is our responsibility to facilitate conversation because we are in this together. Israel Forum has traditionally been hosted as a seated cocktail party in which the audience becomes part of the conversation. We're in a challenging moment, I don't need to tell you this, but there is one thing we do not take for granted. While times are uncertain, community is not. Though we cannot gather in person, we will endeavor to create space for civil discourse and meaningful opportunities to connect to our speakers via this, our first ever, virtual Israel Forum um, event. This virtual platform has also enabled us to welcome guests from all over the country and indeed all over the world, including community, uh, communities across the region in the Middle East. I'm so pleased to welcome you to our JCC and to this program that is the cornerstone of the Sanaben Center for Israel. Throughout the program, Please share your questions in the chat box on your screen. It is so important to us that though we are not in person, that you feel part of the conversation and know that our speakers will do their best to address your questions. If at any point you experience technical difficulties, please chat our host who will do their best to troubleshoot with you. A word of thanks. The Israel Forum is made possible by a generous gift from the Wexler family. We are grateful to Donna Wexler Linden and Larry Linden for envisioning and supporting this program and to the Lambert Sonnenben and Fredericks families whose support created the David H. Sonnenben Center for Israel. I also want to acknowledge the commitment and support of our Sonnenben Center for Israel Advisory Council and the dedication of our chair, Eric Frederick, and to our staff team including Adina Schwartz, Mark Labradoff, and Amanda Schechter, and of course the amazing tech team, Matt Temkin and others, who, without whose efforts today's program would not be possible. And a special thank you to our close partner, Israel Policy Forum, an organization that aims to shape the discourse and mobilize support among American Jewish leaders and United States policymakers for the realization of a viable two-state solution. Today, I am thrilled, really thrilled, to welcome Her Excellency Lana Nuseba, United Arab Emirates Ambassador to the United Nations. I met Ambassador Nuseba when I was in Abu Dhabi in February, right before the world turned upside down. I had the privilege, <laughs> excuse me, of meeting her extraordinary father, who is the Minister of State in the UAE government, but Frankly, I hope I'm not saying anything out of school. It was Ambassador Nuseba who stole the show um, with our group um, that day with her warmth, her intelligence, and her obvious commitment and passion to help her country grow. Ambassador Lana Nuzaki Nuseba was appointed as the permanent representative of the UAE to the United Nations in New York in September 2013. She was also appointed as the non-resident ambassador to, of the UAE to Grenada in November 2017. She has served as the co-chair of the Intergovernmental Negotiations on the Security Council Reform from 2018 to 2020. She has also served as Vice President of the General Assembly for its 72nd session, President of the UN Women Executive Board in 2017, co-facilitator of the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Revitalization of the UN General Assembly for the 71st session, and co-facilitator for the overall review of the implementation of the outcomes of the World Summit on the Information Society in 2015. Furthermore, she chairs the Friends of the Future of the UN, 
Previously, she served in several capacities within the UAE Minister of Foreign Affairs, including the UAE co-special envoy to Afghanistan and to Pakistan. Ambassador Nuseba received her um, MA and BA in history from the University of Cambridge and an MA with distinction in Israeli and Jewish diaspora studies from the University of London. Don't worry, we will be asking her about this fascinating note in her bio. To facilitate her conver to the conversation with Ambassador Nuseba, I am so pleased to welcome the Policy Director of the Israel Policy Forum and Senior Research Fellow of the Kogod Research Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, Michael Kaplow. We are indebted to Michael for his insightful and informative regular emails that explore the very latest challenges and opportunities in the region. Once again, a huge thank you to IPF and to its lay and professional leadership for their partnership. And with that, Michael, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Rabbi Levitt. It's uh, great to be here and, and thanks to the Myers and JCC for hosting, hosting this event. Uh, and I want a uh, special shout out to my friend, uh, Donna Wexler Linden. Um, so uh, we are obviously here in, in a time uh, where there is intense interest in the United States in all sorts of things, uh, particularly the election that will take place here on November 3rd. Um, and despite the fact that everyone seems to be consumed with politics, as you can tell from today's turnout, uh, there is enormous interest in normalization between Israel and the UAE and the Abraham Accords. And so, uh, I'm so I'm so pleased that we have an opportunity today to discuss this with Ambassador Nuseba. So um, Ambassador Nuseba, before we get to uh, the Accords themselves, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about uh, your own background. Um, you know, as Rabbi Levitt pointed out, uh, one of the uh, unusual elements of your biography is that you have a graduate degree in Israel and Jewish diaspora studies which I think it's fair to say is uh, not exactly common for, for Arab diplomats. So uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what drove your interest in these subjects and how has your own knowledge and background contributed to years now of warming relations between the UAE and Israel and eventually to the Abraham Accords themselves? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for that really warm introduction. Rabbi Levitt, I also really fondly remember that lunch in Al Ain, in my family house, which now seems like such a bygone era, as you said, a, a footnote in history, um, when we were a lot freer to move around and be with uh, loved ones than we are today. And I hope that everyone in this call is keeping well and safe, and that your families are all well. And uh, you know, it is a difficult time, but I think that the incredible lesson from this whole period, as Rabbi Levitt said, is the importance even more of community of coming together. Um, of the diversity and tolerance of each other in trying times is often a, a bigger test, stress test uh, of our uh, commitments to each other than anything else. So uh, it is, it's, it's in that vein that I'm here today. I was delighted to receive the invitation and I hope to be able to answer all questions as openly and frankly as I can. Uh, and the one that I always find difficult is anything to do with my personal background. I'm very good at talking on our policies, but um, you choose subjects in your life and you take certain paths and everyone afterwards reads a grand plan into them. And I would say that the driving force for the master's degree that I chose was curiosity, uh, academic interest, fascination with this part of our region uh, that I think has been understudied by Arab diplomats. I was not an Arab diplomat at the time, I was a student uh, looking for a way to avoid the job market for a little bit longer. And in that sense, I wanted to do further extensive study in the Middle East. But frankly, and Rabbi Levitt mentioned my father, I've always been raised to be as curious about what we don't know uh, than to focus on the things that we do know. And I felt that a Middle Eastern program would simply be a lot of what I did know uh, and had been raised in. And so the program that was offered in Israeli and Jewish diaspora studies and the brilliant professor who headed that new program, Dr. Colin Schindler, was really eye-opening for me in so many ways uh, around the origins uh, and philosophy and thinking, Jewish thought, uh, the creation of the state of Israel, a history of everything from Zionism to really analyzing uh, Jabotinsky, uh, and obviously learning Hebrew for a year, which for a Arab speaker is interesting as a cultural experience because there's so much 
uh, that we share in the uh, roots of the language. I found it an incredibly fascinating year. If I had not gone back and gone into uh, the life I had gone into, I think I would have further done further study because it was just very enriching. Um, it did not be, it was not part of the uh, Abraham Accords, this degree I took. It really was uh, something that was just a passion of mine, but I am able to use it now in all of the outreach that I do uh, to genuinely show commitment uh, to, to that curiosity. And I, and I think that's what's driving all of us to be here today. That's this importance, this reliance on um, community, on talking to each other in order to further the conversation, not talking at each other and not what I think has become such an unfortunate part of global politics today, these echo chambers, these silos where we're only comfortable hearing views of people we agree with in, uh, in certain closed circles. I think that's one of the big challenges in terms of getting global politics um, back to that spirit of cooperation. I, uh, I, I sympathize with, uh, with your path of going to graduate study as a way of, uh, of avoiding a real job. I, I did that for, for a long time as well. Um, I'm wondering if we can uh, talk a little bit about uh, another aspect of, of your background, which I think is relevant here, which is that uh, anybody, who, uh, anybody who studies Israeli-Palestinian issues uh, knows, your, knows your last name. You come from a, a very prominent Palestinian, Palestinian family. And so I'm wondering if and how your Palestinian heritage has informed your work and your career, and what does it mean to you to represent the UAE while also maintaining your identity as a member of the Palestinian diaspora? Well, I come from a family that for centuries has been uh, the guardian of the key to the Holy Sepulcher, which I know uh, many of you will have, will have heard of. And I think that story, of course, I grew up in Abu Dhabi, between the Abu Dhabi and the UAE and the UK. So that's been my upbringing. But of course, between family and friends and the connectivity to my heritage, that story is the one that really resonated with me the most um, because it showed uh, a time and a period in history when interfaith community, when the idea of tolerance, the idea of religions and diversity, strengthening each other, not weakening each other, was really paramount in that decision to give a prominent Muslim family in Jerusalem uh, the responsibility to one of the holy, holiest sites in Christendom. And I think that that is so much part of the fabric of what the UAE is about, the country that I love, grew up in, and, and represent today at the UN. I grew up surrounded by all the nationalities that come and live and work in the UAE, um, upward of 200 religions, the temples, the churches, and today we're proud to say the first Jewish synagogues. We're a country where uh, the Pope came to visit the Arabian P Peninsula in the first time in the history of Islam to the Arabian Peninsula uh, last year. Uh, and signed a, a fraternity document with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. Uh, this is a country where we're really proud of the diversity that we represent in the UAE and where that's very much part and parcel of a narrative that we are promoting for our region. And actually, we don't see this as a new narrative. We see this as going back to a time in the Middle East's history when this was the norm, not the exception. And I think that's what we're struggling with today in terms of the competing narratives in a very challenging region that for the past decade or so, uh, the nihilistic agendas, actually two decades at least, the nihilistic agendas of extremists who would like to put forward a view that is uh, ideology based, that is uh, an ideology of hatred and exceptionalism about one's own religious creed I think really challenged us in many ways as a country uh, to become this more assertive foreign policy player than we would naturally inhabit in terms of our natural comfort zones. And I think it's interesting because if you look at the society that exists in the UAE, the interconnectedness of these things, uh, the monuments that we build and that we have built over the past two decades, I think tell the story of what the country is trying to project 
and the monuments are uh, things as diverse as universities like NYU and the campus in Abu Dhabi, to the Sorbonne, to the Louvre Museum, to the Abrahamic family house, which is going to house a synagogue, a church, and a mosque on the same sacred ground with an inter-communal uh, garden where worshippers of all three faiths can meet in solitude and prayer. And I think if you look at those monuments that we build, uh, you will need to look past the skyscrapers, of course, uh, and the tallest buildings and the, and the other uh, things that we aspire to as a dynamic modern country. But look to those monuments, and I think you'll get a really good sense of how we see our role in the region and where this fits into that narrative of what we are trying to promote for the youth of our region. And we very much think this story in the coming period, it has to be their story. And we hope that we can encourage that story to be one of opportunity, of hope, and of optimism. And that's really the setting and the background and the context of the signing of the uh, Abraham Accords. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the Accords themselves. The negotiation and, and signing of the Abraham Accords is uh, certainly one of the most significant developments to come out of the Middle East in the past few years. Can you talk a bit about the factors that drove the timing of normalization of ties between the UAE and Israel and how you expect the relationship between the UAE and Israel to develop going forward. And um, we, have a, we have a related question from Noah Starr, uh, who wants to know if the UAE-Israel relationship is a product of fear of Iran, or is it due to a, a separate breakthrough in establishing a genuine friendship? So I think that the UAE's efforts, first of all, to, set, to strengthen ties with um, the Jewish people, Jewish communities around the world predates this accord and is separate and distinct and really fits into that part uh, of the narrative I was just talking about. Um, so we have a small uh, but growing Jewish community. Um, they're getting their second full-time rabbi. Rabbi Levitt, if you're ever interested in the job in the future, please let us know, we'd love to have you. Um, we um, have actually somebody coming from New York who relocate to, to Dubai to administer to the community. Uh, and they are now proudly calling themselves, uh, which is really touching to me, uh, the Jewish community of the UAE uh, today. And I think that's a step change in how safe and accepted they feel in our country. It's a step change because around the region that has not been the story of the last 50 years or so. With regards to Israel, I think that in many ways, the relationship has been developing organically at the people to people level for many, many years. Uh, and that this was a natural culmination uh, of something that just made sense to us and would have been in the, um, in the picture at some point. So for example, one of the roles I held in the foreign ministry was uh, running the task force, the diplomatic campaign to host the International Renewable Energy Agency in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's a multilateral uh, organization made up of member states that deals with the critical issue uh, of climate change and renewable energy. And one of the key part, points in our campaign at that time was that, of course, it would include an Israeli mission to that agency headquartered in Abu Dhabi, which started in 2013. And our openness in terms of our foreign policy, I think helped our thinking evolve uh, in a more accelerated pace. So for example, we understood that you cannot be a regional hub for global trade, for commerce, for tourism, uh, and not have a relationship with the other big dynamic economy in the region, and that's the state of Israel. We realized that you cannot be an international host to conferences and events whether it's um, wrestling or an international dentistry conference or um, hosting more serious policy discussions, if you're not willing uh, to host a, a regional player like Israel in those discussions. And so in many ways, I think the understanding evolved uh, gradually and organically in our country uh, that eventually this has always, this is going to be part of our uh, foreign policy um, in, in our future to have that relationship. I think what held it back uh, for a number of years, of course, is the Arab position uh, that 
the Arab bloc would negotiate together how Israel is integrated into the region. I think our assessment was that that approach had been tried and tested for numerous years without achieving the desired results of the Arab world, and these are committed foreign policy principles, that we would like to see a two-state solution living side by side in peace, the state of Palestine and the state of Israel, and fully integrate Israel into our region uh, as part and parcel of the Middle East, which is how we see its place. But I think we think we thought at the time, uh, as these ties on the people to people level were evolving, um, that that strategy has not materialized towards the results that we wanted to achieve. And that we needed some kind of game changer uh, that, that sort of changed the dynamic that changed that approach. I think what really precipitated the decision at this time, in this moment of history, and I was honored to be there at the White House signing ceremony on September 15th uh, to witness, as others were there to witness this agreement. Uh, I think what really precipitated the change was the negotiation around suspending annexation. Uh, and I think that the ability to bring that into this agreement, this normalization agreement, uh, as a key part of it, precipitated the acceleration of what has become, had become part and parcel of, of our longer term thinking of Israel's place in the region. I would say that was the accelerator, if you like. Uh, of course, the US government played a critical role in overseeing this agreement and in being uh, the sort of convener uh, on this. And I think that was essential and we're grateful to them for that. And as you know, Bahrain, uh, followed suit with their own normalization agreement. Essentially, what we're saying is that we can today do two things at the same time. We can hold a principled position around the two-state solution, which ultimately is not for us uh, to negotiate or any other Arab country to negotiate. It's for the Palestinians and the Israelis to sit down and decide their future course together. But we can do that and at the same time have a real and meaningful relationship with Israel uh, that is warm. And I think that's the other thing that you alluded to, um, Michael, which is really um, a big part of this. There is no historical baggage in terms of UAE and Israel. No wars were fought. There's no people-to-people uh, -people memories of hurt or so forth. And I think there's no border issues that had to be delineated. And I think that's really helped the very quick uh, warming up of the relationship once the normalization agreement was signed. And you're going to see that relationship develop in very practical ways at the outset. So for example, we immediately signed MOUs to fight COVID-19 together. And can anyone criticize today collaboration between two such medically forward leaning uh, countries around one of the biggest global challenges that humanity has faced in the last hundred years? that will benefit everybody, including the Palestinians, if that cooperation leads to a breakthrough. Uh, we're going to cooperate around uh, the future of energy and water, uh, water security. And coming from the arid region that we do, I think that the collaboration around that, again, can lift up many around the region. We're looking at uh, creating job growth and opportunities. And as we face the precipice of a horrible global recession uh, on the coattails of COVID-19, this will lift up the 65% or so of the Middle East population that are classified as youth and that are gonna be struggling for job opportunities in the coming decades. And so I really think we see this partnership starting on that level. Uh, of course, tourism is going to be a big one. There's already a lot of excitement about visiting uh, holy sites and of course for Israeli tourists to come to the UAE. Educational exchanges, students, Hebrews already being taught in our diplomatic academy. Uh, and that's, you know, happened in the matter of weeks. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think all of these will offer such extraordinary opportunity for interaction on a people to people level and as someone who has lived and absorbed many different cultures in my career in life, I genuinely believe that the politicians can sit in closed doors and talk about 
uh, agreements for many, many years. But as soon as people connect and understand that they're more the same than they are different, the quicker the acceptance grows uh, that a warm peace around the region is possible. And I think that's essentially a, a part of this. You mentioned Iran, and the reason I went into such detail about what we're excited about in this partnership is to demonstrate that it's not about Iran. It's not about a negative agenda. It's actually about a very positive, forward-leaning agenda uh, that really promotes this model of diversity, inclusion, tolerance, and yes, job opportunity and growth and economics that we think we're going to need to survive and thrive in the coming period. So it's about an agenda of hope and opportunity and not about a coalition against one country or another. Clearly in the future, with all of these people to people exchanges and the cooperation around shared areas of interest, clearly in the future, uh, having similar um, policy dialogue and discussion is going to be an added benefit of the relationship, but it's not the primary driving force today. You mentioned West Bank annexation, and I want to drill down on that uh, a bit if I can. Um, when the accords were announced, the, the UAE emphasized that normalization of ties was only possible if the Israeli government suspended its plan to unilaterally annex West Bank territory. And this approach had, of course, been laid over the summer by uh, your colleague in DC, Ambassador Alo Taiba, who wrote an op-ed in Yediot Achronot, an Israeli newspaper, uh, laying, out, laying out that case. Uh, the public text of the deal, however, is silent on annexation. So how important is it to the UAE that annexation be suspended? And do you envision this suspension to have uh, a defined time frame of sorts? Uh, I'll, I'll note that Ambassador, uh, US Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, yesterday said that in his view, uh, this, is, um, this is not a uh, it's not a permanent uh, suspension of annexation. It's, it's simply a temporary halt. And if the Israeli government does indeed move forward with annexation at some point, what will that mean for Israeli UAE relations? So really, I think a critical question. And I think this is where uh, organizations like yours and supporters of this step change in how we do things in the region are going to play such a critical role because there are always critics and detractors and naysayers to an agreement like this. And in many ways, that's why it was negotiated so quickly and so discreetly uh, to the point where it was essentially uh, signed off within weeks of starting the negotiations it was in order to get it over the line um, before it was attacked as being lacking in this or that aspect. You know, again, I'll repeat that we, at the end of the day, are not the file holders on uh, the final Middle East peace that has been a, a goal a, 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 of, of many uh, for decades. That's not what this is. We're not saying this is um, the Middle East peace plan. That would, it's a very complex, uh, protracted, uh, you know, historical process uh, that needs to culminate. We wanted to help it in our normalization agreement with Israel. We wanted to help that process. And by bringing uh, and having the US uh, as a guarantor of that agreement, we also, I think, have a interested party bear witness to what was agreed. Some of which um, is, as you mentioned, in the public document, and some of which is in our shared understanding of what, is what has been negotiated. Look, in the end of the day, uh, a normalization agreement or a peace agreement or however you see it is an act of good faith. And it's an act of good faith with the belief by all parties that the peace dividend far outweighs any other objective. And Ambassador Ateba, I think, really laid that out, that case out, speaking for the first time for an Arab diplomat, if you want to talk about uh, breaking new ground, speaking for the first time to the Israeli public. Uh, that's who he addressed that article to. It wasn't a government to government, it was to the Israeli public to say that we want you to be integrated in our region. We want these ties with you. We want normalized relations. We want the people to people exchange. But 
in our view, annexation and the failure of the two state solution to materialize will ultimately affect that vision and will ultimately affect all of our shared collective security and our shared prosperity. I think that's essentially the message. And that's why in many ways that people ask, well, why did the UAE even involve itself in that particularly thorny issue? Uh, and it's because we could, and we thought it was helpful. And we thought that in the longer term, having another voice in the region, uh, like the Egyptians and Jordanians are in that room uh, when uh, Israel is discussing uh, policy implications in terms of their uh, decisions is helpful. It's helpful to have another channel of communication that sees the objective ultimately as the security of both states and the stability and prosperity of both peoples. So in our view, uh, there, is no, there is no plan B that we are aware of that suits the needs of both, uh, the, both communities and parties. And so we think we need to double down and support this objective. But as I said at the beginning, we think we can do that at the same time by having a strong diplomatic relationship with Israel, uh, symbolized most recently in the signing uh, of aviation agreements, there'll be 28 weekly flights between the two countries. So you can really see in numbers what the people to people, to people exchange post COVID will look like. On annexation, nothing is, uh, nothing is forever. What we're trying to do, and I think, for example, the Secretary General of the UN came out and welcomed the agreement. Most of the international community came out and welcomed the agreement and one of the key reasons they welcomed it uh, is not because it's a normalization agreement between two countries, which would often go without comment. It's because it created that window that was really frightening many in European capitals uh, and definitely in Arab capitals, that annexation would put an end to any idea of the two state solution. Uh, and that this gave everybody a window, an opportunity uh, to regroup, rethink strategy, and come to the table. Now that coming to the table, as I said, is between the two sides with any of the international interlocutors that they wish to see there. It's not, uh, it's not the UAE's role, but that window was created when at a certain point, if you remember, uh, there was very clear policy directives around the annexation issue that has been uh, somewhat muted uh, since the signing of the agreement. How long it lasts, I think a lot of that depends on the actors involved and the commitment and the goodwill towards resuming negotiations. That's the only way forward. It's hard work, um, but I hope we've created some, some space, some breathing opportunity. So I, I wanna um, turn to some of the ways that the Abraham Accords are gonna impact uh, other, uh, other actors in the region. And um, I'd like to start with the Palestinians. Um, who have probably uh, been the party that has criticized the Abraham Accords the most harshly. Um, the, the Palestinian leadership criticized the UAE for signing this deal with Israel before uh, the negotiation of a permanent status agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, as, as you had earlier noted. And uh, public polling inside of the West Bank and Gaza reveals that uh, ordinary Palestinians are, um, are not enthused with the deal, uh, presumably for similar reasons. So how do you respond to this Palestinian criticism that the Abraham Accords is a, is a betrayal of the Palestinian cause? And how does the UAE plan on using its relationship with Israel to support the Palestinian desire for independence and sovereignty beyond the annexation issue? I think that the UAE and its leadership have been one of the most stalwart supporters of the uh, Palestinian cause for decades. And that has been both politically, but also in terms of humanitarian aid, and also in terms of its contributions to UNRWA, uh, et cetera, and, and as an active player of, of the Arab League. So I, you know, as, as a, Palestinian origin Emirati whose family was given the chance to integrate into the UAE uh, to take up nationality in the late 60s. Uh, my father came uh, after graduating from Cambridge and after the uh, 67 war was going on and made return uh, to his, his hometown impossible. 
Uh, I think that story and the story of many other Palestinian di diaspora in the region and around the world um, speaks to uh, needing to focus on the next 50 years and ask ourselves collectively, what is our objective? What is it that we're aiming uh, to achieve for the youth in all of these countries? Um, and in particular, in the West Bank and Gaza, where the situation is so difficult and challenging, uh, and we don't uh, underappreciate that as we take these steps. Having said that, and at the same time, we did not believe that not having diplomatic relations with Israel in any way helped those objectives or helped that cause uh, to move forward. In fact, we would say that in many ways, um, you know, it was time for different thinking around uh, Israel's place in the region. And we were ready to take the step and show the moral courage that I think our leadership showed in taking that first step uh, and creating a pathway to move out of a certain mindset, a zero sum mindset, uh, towards a more broad view of the prospects for peace in the region. Um, we all need to um, influence our harshest critics and our right, um, more sort of conservative flanks in our governments and our societies. And so I'm not going to say either that in the UAE there's a homogenous view of everything, nor is there in Israel, nor is there in the Palestinian territories and leadership. Um, but I will say again, primarily that the UAE took a sovereign decision uh, under international law that is within our right to do so. We took a sovereign decision that undoubtedly is in not only our interests, but in the interests of the Israelis, but also in the interests of the United States and the region, uh, but one that we hope will we will be able to demonstrate um, in terms of its positive impact in the years to come by putting in the hard work. Uh, and to your point on annexation, I, you know, I think that the one thing we are hoping, and of course we are unknown quant actors to each other, we're getting to know each other. One of the things we are hoping is that the Israeli governments, uh, successive governments will be strategic about this normalization agreement, that they, they will look at the long term view in terms of uh, what the benefit and the impact could be if more and more countries were part of this new uh, Middle East uh, region, as it were. And the way to do that is to, of course, resume negotiations with the Palestinians and is to, of course, uh, set aside the policy, the, the policy of thinking about annexation, again, because it would be the, the death blow to that two state reality. Uh, and so we're hoping they look at this strategically, that they analyze the peace dividend as being worth, um, you know, some of these policy decisions. Every government has its own domestic constituencies that they speak to and they will speak to them in their own language that resonates with those uh, groups. Um, but our stated position, our commitment to the two-state solution was actually even reiterated on the White House lawn by His Highness Sheikh Abdullah uh, bin Zayed Al Nahyan, our foreign minister in Arabic uh, to the two-state solution to the Palestinian people. And I think that commitment holds firm. Of course, the Palestinian leadership has the right, as we had the right, to move in the direction we thought was right for us. They have the right to have the reaction that they have. And we hope that in the future, uh, we can be helpful uh, from an Arab country perspective to the resumption of negotiations when and if they do resume. And if we're asked to do so, we, we would do so. You mentioned, um, you've mentioned a bunch of times the, the impact that you think that the Abraham Accords can have on other states in the region. And, and we have a couple of questions from the audience on this issue, uh, Peter Joseph, um, hi Peter, uh, asks, how do you think the model of this new UAE-Israel relationship will affect the nature of Israel's relationship with other Arab treaty partners, such as Egypt and Jordan? And we have a, 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 another uh, question in the same vein from Alexander Longaroff, uh, who asks, speaking of Arab curiosity for the Jewish world in Israel, to what extent do you think countries across the Arab world will be able to formally display such interest? And do you see any differences here between um, the Arab street, Arab populations, uh, and Arab leaders? Thank you. Um, so Egypt and Jordan 
and the context when those agreements were signed were different contexts. Um, they were conflictual contexts. They had a lot of the gritty security issues to resolve. Uh, I think that what's different about uh, our normalization agreement is that essentially it's two countries that didn't recognize each other formally, but essentially had over the past decade a number of growing ties and had decided to take that step to formalize uh, their relationship uh, because of the signal it sent to the region um, of optimism and hope. I think they're just three different contexts. I think Egypt and Jordan have a different domestic constituency to speak to than we do. Uh, in the UAE, this agreement has been incredibly popular. It's the one thing that everyone comments to me uh, almost from the outset is that social media in both, and we're very big on social media, our youth are all on social media. And I think um, Israeli youth are also quite avid uh, social media users, uh, has been incredibly warm, has been incredibly excited. Um, youth groups from both countries have already spoken. Women from both countries have already met in the first uh, UAE Israeli Business Women Forum. Uh, our perceptions of women's empowerment and women's role in society is similar. Our perceptions of youth and the dynamism of youth and the con contribution they can make uh, to our countries is similar. Our interest in all things from space exploration, AI, uh, to cybersecurity, to uh, commerce and trade is, uh, you know, is quite, uh, is, is coalescing in an interesting way. Um, so I think that that is the, is the difference, is this has been received very well in the UAE public and it's been received very well uh, from what we have seen in the Israeli public domain. Uh, and I think that in the rest of the Arab world, what is interesting, if you read the Arab press um, following the normalization of this agreement, it's a very different space than if you'd read um, what you would have expected in the Arab press 15 years ago, very different space. Uh, there was very little criticism um, it was mostly um, positive or quietly encouraging. And I think these are bellwethers of a region that frankly is tired of conflict, uh, tired of decades of hardline positions on all sides, um, on numerous issues that frankly hold the region back from its full potential. And I think again, that argument around the full potential is hopefully going to be the argument that wins the day in the public opinions that we are all obviously interested in assessing and uh, uh, and and understanding as we go. Um, so that's that's on the first question. I think on the difference between the sort of famous Arab street and the Arab leaders is obviously you know governments and elites take a nuanced position on things and maybe publics take a longer time to. Um, to change out of a certain way that they understand an issue. If you spend your formative years listening to a certain kind of narrative uh, and rhetoric on your, um, in your reading, in your family group, in your education, in your textbooks, uh, I think it's very difficult in many ways to shift that mindset. And again, I go back to the hope that younger people from all of these countries, um, hopefully not growing up with that same uh, historical baggage in many ways of what their parents and their grandparents speak about when they speak about the Middle East, um, will be able to change that mindset set and make that shift more quickly, especially when they see the things uh, that already have been announced that again, bring the idea of hope and optimism to the region. So the most recent is the UAE and Israel and the US announcing a $3 billion investment fund called the Abraham Fund to, to funnel funding into the idea of economic growth uh, in the region, uh, private investment, development. Um, and, and again, these economic gains uh, that we very much hope are going to be also directed at the Palestinian population and people, uh, as well as the youth around the region. We think again, these will sell the story, not of an economic model trumping a political ideal, but of how we intend to survive collectively over the next 50 years by promoting a new narrative of integration. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's the only way to keep 
to keep selling this agenda. And I think as a country, we're again, uncomfortable with selling an agenda because it's, it's not in our nature, it's not in our DNA, um, but we see ourselves surrounded by neighbors and ideologies that are so destructive um, and morally nihilistic um, that we haven't seen any alternative in the past decade, but to re, uh, regroup our foreign policy around selling a different narrative to the youth of our region um, that really fully incorporates them uh, on the decision-making table uh, and that offers them a vision of optimism, hope, and, and, and what the future could hold for all of us. I think COVID-19 has been described as the, um, the great big equalizer, but in, any, in many, many ways, especially in the coming period when vaccine developments will potentially fragment the world into the haves and have nots in an even more defined way, uh, the failure to collectively respond on these global issues is really too traumatizing to even think about uh, from a policy perspective. And particularly in our part of the world, we are a trigger point away from so many conflict points and fracture points um, and misunderstandings that spill to conflict so quickly with endless loss of life and opportunity and hope again. Um, and so I just hope that we can all sign up to it. And this is why I'm so signed up to it. And I go into the UN every day, very proud of this story in terms of the work that uh, I'm doing and proud that for the last decade, this, you know, you mentioned the Arab street, there's been a, a poll that's done um, amongst Arab youth around the region uh, to choose which country, if they could choose which country, any country in the world to immigrate to, to live, to set up a life for themselves and their family, which would it be? And, you know, over even immigration to the US, Canada, Europe, uh, Arab youth has chosen the UAE in this polling survey. Uh, and I think it's because no one wants to give up on our region just yet. And I don't think any of us should give up on our region. There's a lot of opportunity and, and hope if we, if we all dig in now and do the hard work. I want to ask you about uh, the UN, since uh, that, is, that is in fact your, <laughs> your, your day job. Um, so the UAE and Israel are, are both in some ways seeking changes at the UN. The UAE is looking to be elected to a two-year term on the Security Council for the first time in over 35 years. And Israel, as always, is looking to blunt uh, what it sees as disproportionate focus and criticism to which it is subjected in various UN bodies and institutions. Do you view the way Israel has historically been treated at the UN um, as, as problematic? And are there ways in which the UAE and Israel can cooperate at the UN going forward to advance their respective interests. And um, there's, a, there's a related question uh, from Joan Lurie, uh, who wants to know if the UAE is open to taking a look at UNRWA and its role in precluding a two-state solution through advancing uh, the right of return. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'll start with UAE, Israel, cooperation um, in the future at the UN. And you know, I go back to my, my opening that I think that at the beginning, uh, we're getting to know each other. Uh, so it's sort of, um, you know, we're on, we're on the second date, if you like. Um, and that's going to happen with the people-to-people -people exchanges, the visa exemption agreements we signed, the aviation, et cetera. And it needs to happen. And we need to build that trust and confidence in each other. Uh, and I think then the next two or three or four layers are going to be uh, trilateral cooperation. For example, I've had some interesting approaches from different countries wanting to see how the th three countries could work together on a file that is a shared interest, for example. And then eventually, of course, to multilateral. I have already met with my uh, counterpart, uh, my Israeli counterpart, the UN, Ambassador Gilad Erdan. Uh, we had a very productive meeting. and. It was, you know, a good hour and a half, two hours. And what was interesting about it, and I think so encouraging, is that we talked about everything except regional politics. So we talked about cooperating around women's empowerment. We talked about cooperating around the digital space and the importance of uh, digital regulation because of the use of that, the internet by extremists. Uh, we talked about COVID-19. 
we had a long and fruitful discussion around climate change and renewable energy and our perspectives of uh, the Paris Agreement and future negotiations. And so essentially we talked about everything where we agree and where we both have something to bring to the table in a UN context. Um, and I think that was a really encouraging first meeting and there will be subsequent meetings. Um, you know, we are going uh, to be hopefully elected with a high number of votes to the UN Security Council next year. And we will put forward in our membership of the Security Council, the vision that I was outlining uh, around diversity and inclusion and tolerance being the hallmark today of stable and secure states. And it's not enough anymore to just think we can be this way in our own borders. We've realized that we need other countries to also um, hold those similar values uh, dear in order for us all to, uh, to survive and to, and to prosper in the region. So I think we will very much be putting that uh, agenda forward um, at the UN. Uh, you know, again, the next steps are going to be how that cooperation um, broadens. Um, it's a step-by-step -step approach. I think that um, you know, Israel has, like other countries, um, seen the UN possibly through the lens of one major issue. And today, as I said from my meeting with Ambassador Erdan, I think it's, it's good that they see the UN as a multilateral space for them to show their contribution and their, uh, their forward-leaning thinking on so many of these other issues. Um, and we see where we where we go from there. Um, on UNRWA, you know, it's a it's a much bigger question. Uh, you know, it's not one that I think um, is for us to uh, is to have a strong to have a strong view on. It's something that needs to be to be discussed collectively. The Secretary General is incredibly interested and has been a proponent of, as I said, using the this window um, to push forward a restart of negotiations possibly with more countries uh, around the table if uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians are comfortable with that uh, to sort of make it more um, um, multilateral in approach. And I think we would uh, be supportive of any initiative uh, that realistically um, and in good faith um, work towards achieving this, this two state. Uh, reality that we're also committed to. I think that's essentially the case, but the details, how, how other UN entities fit into that bigger picture, you know, I think is part of the granular negotiations that need to happen uh, down the road when, when the negotiations resume in good faith. So that, I hope that answers the question, essentially that we're, we're in this getting to know each other phase. Um, and, and as we build, we build on that, I think there will be a chance for cooperation on, on, on many files to come. Um, with, the, with the couple of minutes we have left, I, I do want to make sure that we talk about uh, the American Jewish community. Um, Nicole Galecka uh, asks if there's a practical role envisioned for American Jewish organizations in supporting these peace accords and business endeavors between the UAE and Israel. And, and I'll, you know, I'll add from, uh, from my end, um, as someone who is an expert on Jewish diaspora communities, what message do you want to send to American Jews and what role can American Jews in general play in helping to advance peace and warmer relations throughout the region? I think an incredibly instrumental role is the short answer. We, as in our leadership and our diplomats, et cetera, have been talking to American Jewish groups um, you know, for well over a decade in, uh, in an outreach that I think is about, as I mentioned, um, hearing views from outside the region, um, understanding different perspectives, appreciating the diversity of those perspectives. Um, going back to where I started from, genuine curiosity, um, which I think drives so much of this, um, and really, um, pushing forward the idea um, that by being siloed in our communications, uh, we haven't helped move the dial in the way that we'd have liked to see in the last few decades. We haven't helped move that dial. In fact, I'd say we've in many ways regressed further um, into, our, into those echo chambers that I was talking about. So I think obviously 
uh, any Arab country and Israel would tell you today that the role of the United States in security in our region and security for our, our countries is a paramount role. They are primary, they're everyone's primary strategic partner uh, in the region. Uh, and so the influence that uh, Jewish groups in America bring to bear on their policymakers, on the discourse, on the thinking uh, is clearly essential. Um, and I think that this brings me back full circle to um, the narrative that I was describing at the beginning um, that we need an agenda that doesn't try to divide the peoples in the region. And that starts first of all, um, and ultimately with, with community and faith. Uh, I think that's what it brings us back to. And if we can come back to community and faith uh, and the place of all faiths and peoples um, to, to live in peace and without hostility in our region, I think we can build, build out from there. Um, you know, one of the, the very touching visits for his highness that he took when he was recently in Berlin and met with the Israeli foreign minister for the first time uh, was the visit to uh, the Holocaust Memorial there. And again, the message he was giving out was that this is uh, important for me too, as a leader from the Arab region to acknowledge what has happened in Jewish history, uh, to recognize it and to offer um, my words also um, towards that, uh, towards that tragedy, and that it's not taboo. I think the Abraham Accords shows that a relationship with Israel is not taboo. Uh, and I think that the more people kind of come into that widening circle, um, that we can build a consensus around acceptance, uh, the more that we are able to move the dial on some of the thornier political issues. And of course, they are thorny. Otherwise, someone would have had, uh, you know, a brilliant plan that would have solved this decades ago, um, but they are thorny. Uh, I think we believe it can be done. I think we try and show every day that with the right leadership uh, and with the right backing from your society and your people, you can move those mountains. Um, but again, we offer that humbly. And we also say that the hard work starts here. Um, it's easier to sign an agreement than it is to implement its spirit. And so we are committed to the spirit of that agreement. And we hope that American Jews are also going to come on board and be committed to that spirit and help it foster uh, newer agreements uh, around the region uh, and globally in terms of the cooperation we're all seeking. So I could, I could do this all day, but unfortunately uh, we're, we're, at the, we're at the hour mark. So um, uh, I wanna thank you for your, for your detail, for your candor. I hope that we can continue this another time and uh, I will turn things back over to Rabbi Levitt to close it out. Thank you. Our deepest gratitude to Ambassador Nuseba and to Michael Kaplow for that unbelievably inspiring and thoughtful conversation. I think all of us feel just a little bit better than we did before this conversation started. Um, uh, I want to, um, uh, you can take a look in the chat. We're, we're giving you the access to Michael's um, column today which is on this subject, particularly with a focus on Turkey. So I urge you to take a look at that. Ambassador Nuseba, as soon as I can get on a plane, I'm gonna join my colleague, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, um, who I know you know well, um, in Abu Dhabi. Um, and a huge thank, thank you. I, it's just a point of privilege to John Sexton, the former president of NYU for his extraordinary work in the region and for inviting me to go so that I could meet the ambassador and we could we could be here today. And to all of you who took time out of your mornings uh, or afternoons or evenings, wherever you happen to be, to be with us um, today, thank you. Our intentioning for all our programming is to begin the conversation. So please stay in touch with us, look online for our programs, and we will be in touch with you as we build on this important conversation including for future um, Israel Forum programming that will feature prominent Israeli and Palestinian voices on this new relationship. Finally, programs like today's special Israel Forum depend on your generous support. And trust me when I say we need it more than ever. Please consider making a contribution to our Sonnenberg Center for Israel by texting community to 56512 
or visiting us online at mmjccm.org backslash support Israel. You'll see that, that information in the chat. Thanks everybody. Um, please stay well, stay healthy and stay hopeful. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.